welcome all to Silver Lighting for Learning, episode 81, Education Enabled by Technology, Fostering Learning in Under-Resourced Village Schools in China. And today we have Jasmine Zhu and Chiran Wang with us. Jasmine's coming to us from Shanghai and from the other half of the world, far, far away in Maine, uh, we have Chiran. <laughs> Tehran was part of the project we're going to talk about actually in China, studying it, well, both as a teacher offering synchronous English training to students in rural parts of China, in central and western China, as well as following up after she was a teacher, doing research on it, and her dissertation, lo and behold, as on this particular project, of which she graduated a year ago from Indiana University, and it's at Colby College now in Maine doing great things there because uh, it's a great place and she's the right person for the job in the language center there. And so I'm gonna have Tehran introduce this project that was involves kind of a hybridization of learning, enabling people to learn in new ways, um, really stretching the edges of technology in a way that um, is experimental, which is always what this show is about exciting, innovative, experimental things. And sometimes they work, maybe sometimes they don't work. We'll hear from both sides today from our two guests who have been involved in this project for a couple of years. So uh, Tehran, you wanna take over at this point and explain more specifically the title of the pro project or the initiative or the nonprofit and the history a, a little bit. And Jasmine can also give us some of the history. And then you have some slides that you're gonna show us as well. So. Um, Charan, why don't you take over from here? Okay, yeah, thank you, Kurt, for this uh, wonderful introduction. And um, thank you so much for um, everyone for joining us today. And um, I'm going to show the slide that I prepared. Um, can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so I will start um, from just talking about my personal experiences, especially my uh, online voluntary teaching experience. So it happened uh, five years ago when I was in, uh, still a graduate student uh, in the US and I saw this uh, great opportunity through WeChat. Uh, and I think uh, it's great because um, there, uh, I am, although I'm in the US, but I can still um, offering some um, classes uh, in China. So I applied it through WeChat and I did an online interview uh, with the, the project uh, Voluntary Online, so which is the name of the nonprofit organization. Um, and they offered some online training for me and then I started online teaching. Uh, so after a semester of teaching, I visit the school. So, um, well, I was an online teacher, which is unpaid. And uh, my first semester I teach, I, I was teaching uh, third grade English. Um, so there are 22 students uh, in my class and it's a village school called Cun Xiao in Southeastern China. The class meets uh, once a week, each for 40 minutes. So um, before moving a little bit more about my personal experience, I want to, um, kind of mention why I used uh, synchronous hybrid learning to refer to this kind of um, classroom. Um, so real-time learning environments simultaneously face-to-face -face and online uh, because this um, class, it has both face-to-face -face, um, component and also online uh, component. So I think it's uh, hybrid learning. Uh, students, they all go to the classroom, a computer lab, and then I meet them uh, online. So um, it's uh, this kind of learning often facilitated by online video software such as Zoom. So uh, in this um, organization, in this nonprofit, uh, we use uh, Zoomu, which is uh, very similar in terms of the functions. Um, so that, that is the, that part. Uh, so I also want to mention about interactions, the pattern of interaction happening in this class, uh, because uh, me as an online teacher, so uh, I am the, the teacher offering the classes. However, there is also a classroom teacher because um, students all go to the classroom 
um, if just me teaching there, sometimes I don't know what's happening in the class. So the nonprofit also um, requests uh, classroom teachers from the local school. So they're there to help facilitate uh, the hy synchronous hybrid classes. And uh, you can see the circles. So the overlapped part, um, which shows there are some interactions between online teacher, which is me and the students and the classroom teacher with me and classroom teacher with the student. And sometimes maybe there are three. So the three of um, three entities all interacted together. And when whenever I maybe sometimes ask students to do kind of group discussion, so that the student to student um, interaction. So I kind of uh, used Anderson's uh, model of interaction in distance learning to kind of illustrate the different kinds of interactions in this class. Uh, so for instance, students, they all sit in the classroom. So it's more, it's always face-to-face -face learning. However, when I visited the school, I also find students, they will, uh, they have cell phones, they will um, chat with each other to, to help facilitate their learning outside classroom. So uh, that is something that surprised me. So there's also online uh, component there and content um, because uh, the, the classroom, the teaching materials I provide will be showing on the screen. However, students will also have uh, their own. Uh, so so they, they take notes and sometimes they share with each other and they uh, write some um, homework. So that's also, it also has face-to-face -face component and teacher because uh, there is both online teacher and face-to-face uh, local teacher there to help facilitate the class. So um, there's also this hybrid component. And uh, within the, the online teachers, we also have a English teacher uh, group. So I believe that uh, that group is created after uh, Jasmine joined the uh, nonprofit, which is very helpful for all online teachers to share their experiences. So uh, you can see there are all the different kinds of um, interactions happening. So I just want to share with you my very first online English class experience because that is very um, something very new to me uh, five years ago because hybrid learning at that time, uh, there was a pandemic and something I've never experienced before. And um, I was there at my first class, I was sharing a photo of me when I was a little baby and introduced to the students about me and uh, my uh, experience and um, myself as a teacher um, and students all there in this computer lab, uh, this, the computers. Uh, so uh, there you can see students, each of them has one and there's a projector, the screen here and there's another loudspeaker over here, which is not featured in this photo. And this is the uh, classroom teacher. <laughs> She's there to help with it. So, um, uh, in order to show you a more like a clear picture of uh, what a typical um, computer lab looks like, so uh, because my dissertation is at another province in southwestern China, so um, which is this school here, and their lab looks like this. So I just want to show you these little things here. This is the uh, small wired. You can see the wired uh, microphone here. So students will use these microphones whenever they want to ask a question or talk to the teacher or answer the teacher's question. And there is not also another big one uh, always on the instructor's desk uh, to capture the whole classroom sound. So uh, when I was teaching firstly, my first class, I have some concerns. Uh, and some of the concerns um, always uh, really uh, makes me feel whether I, why, whether I was able to provide effective instruction to the students. So the first one, how did I sound like in the physical classroom? Was I clear? How could I tell if all, they all understood me? Uh, should I stop or repeat things or just move on? So um, I, later on, I figured out that um, because we have this uh, distance between us, it's maybe better to initiate more verbal uh, responses and body moves. 
than normally I would do in a face-to-face -face class because sometimes I cannot really see clearly uh, the students uh, sitting in the last row. As I mentioned, there were 22 students in the class. So um, having asking them to do more maybe body movements or initiate more verbal responses really helped me a lot. And also this interaction will help students to engage in the class more. Um, and I also talked with the facilitating teacher to confirm things went well. Um, she actually throughout the semester, she said uh, she constantly confirmed with me that students really uh, like the class and they always asked her whether I can give them more classes or can I meet with them face to face. And that's why I finally visited the school because they, they really want to see me. Um, so I went there actually as a surprise because I didn't tell the students I'm going to visit them. I just want to see, uh, give them a happy surprise. So I went there and the students recognized me uh, in, the, uh, in the very beginning, although I didn't because um, as I mentioned, um, I wasn't really able to see clearly uh, students in the last row. So, uh, but students saw me and they, they were so surprised and they were, they were so happy. And I was there uh, talking with them. And they, so there is a mango tree in the school yard. And uh, I was just asking, oh, what's this tree? Uh, and the student told me it's a mango tree. I was so surprised. I said, oh, wow, you, you guys have mango tree in the school. That's so cool. It's my first time seeing a mango tree. And then uh, the student just climbed all, all the way up and uh, he got a mango for me, a green one. So, which is, um, uh, very, um, it makes me feel very, um, yeah, touched and very uh, happy. Uh, and also you see this little mini crab, which is just as the big size as my fingerprint, a uh, fi finger, uh, fingertips. So it's very uh, interesting to see uh, their, um, their life at the school and these things. So what I learned from the visit, students really love uh, the class, they want more classes. And if we can provide thoughtful instruction, uh, hybrid synchronous class can be a good opportunity to foster language learning and develop students' interest in learning and ability to learn independently. I think being able to um, help them develop the, the ability to learn independently is very important. Uh, so this is the, um, the picture from the other, so from my dissertation uh, study school. So uh, you can see here, there the teacher is offering an online class and students from other, um, other classes are, are also trying to, to get into the class to, to be able to see the, the class, which means the, they really like this uh, learning. So my changes after the visit, um, so I incorporated more authentic learning materials and activities because um, I was thinking about how can I better uh, use the, this um, tool or this uh, technology to help them to connect with uh, more authentic tasks in terms of language learning. So I video screen, um, live video streaming tools to grocery stores. Um, I teach them with objects. So I go to grocery store and I show them uh, what is this object or a vegetable. And they, they try to pronounce the word and they also practice speaking and uh, talking with people. Um, so, uh, uh, and I also bring guests to my class so that students uh, actually feel uh, they are learning something they can really communicate language as uh, communication. So. Uh, that really helps them to feel more engaged with my uh, class. And I also used more um, songs, cartoons, and as I mentioned, I think uh, the movements is really important uh, for me to show, to, to see their learning. So dances as well. Um, I also try to break in the limits of space and make sure, I think this is a great way to break in limits of space and make use of the flexibility of distance learning and the affordances of technology. So don't just be um, confined uh, into these spaces, uh, maybe just classroom space, but if you use uh, technology to help connect different spaces, I think that's a uh, great, um, I think a great approach to help students engage in this kind of learning. Um, Ron, and, Ron, we're we're yeah. at about 10 minutes, so you uh, might wanna wrap up on this 
um, yeah. They're asking questions. Yeah. I think it's my first last slide. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, so yeah. Final comments. So, then, final points then. Final points. Build more connections with them. So I think it's important to know them individually. So I try to. Uh, during the visit, I got some, many of them actually added me to their um, like QQ or WeChat. Uh, so I, I can be friends with them after that. So I think it's, it's really important to know students individually. So can you, so Jasmine, you're involved in teacher training. Uh, how extensive or how, how, uh, how wide of a reach does this program have? Um, and and how, how many schools or school districts does, the, does your program reach out to? And how many teachers are involved in the teacher training? Um, right now, actually, um, uh, compared with, to uh, Charan, I'm quite new to the organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, she has uh, uh, worked there, I mean, uh, worked for volunteer teachers five years ago, but I only joined the organization two years ago. Uh, but up till now, uh, we have uh, built those distant classrooms in over 60 schools, village schools. And every semester, I should say, every semester, we uh, a lot of uh, volunteer teachers apply to teach online. So um, as teacher training involved, I think maybe over 100 every semester they would apply, I mean, uh, those teachers. And then not every one of them could pass the training. So uh, maybe only 30% of them could pass the training and actually to uh, start teaching through video classroom like Zoom. Uh, right now, um, I am the only uh, full-time uh, person, personnel to, to work in that teacher training area. But fortunately, we have a lot of people, volunteer teacher trainers to help me. Help me. Now, right now, I think we have uh, a lot of uh, experienced teachers over uh, the country and a lot of teachers uh, in, in, in America, in Canada as well. So very fortunately, right now, uh, for, for instance, uh, for science subjects and for music subjects and uh, what else? Uh, uh, computer, uh, computer science, a com uh, computer uh as we call it, it's uh, information technology, but you know, for primary students, that's just basic. So for a lot of subjects, volunteer teacher trainers help me with the teacher training process. And for teacher training process, um, as Chara mentioned just now, um, usually we would um, ask those volunteer teachers to prepare two to four trial classes before they actually start the real uh, online teaching. And before the trial classes, they need to study a lot of uh, online materials um, through our resource bank in our uh, organization, which also was provided and built uh, within our volunteer teachers. So as you can see, our, we, we are very grateful to all those volunteer teachers. They, they really help us a lot in various ways in building materials, in collecting all the materials, and also um, they involve a lot with teacher training, yeah. So you do more than just English training then? You're doing computer science, music, all, all, is it all disciplines? You're teaching everything? Um, no, I'm not teaching everything, but I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for the first trial class mm -hmm. that is for every discipline. I mean, so, uh, let me give an example. So every first, uh, trial class for, for, for every teacher, what we do is that we, um, just as Charan showed the, in the slides, we uh, ask them to prepare a kind of self-introduction session and orientation class for students. And for that class, I involved in every teacher because um, we believe that the first impression is very important for students to see the teacher actually through a video classroom. And so for that very first class, the purpose, the teaching purpose of that class is not teaching any subjects, any content knowledge, anything, but just to know people to each other. So for, so for that class, um, my role is to help 
uh, the teachers to uh, design some uh, interactive uh, activities so that they can know the students and to let students know themselves as well. And also there is a third purpose in that class is that the teacher need to um, introduce the subject to the students. For example, we have a subject called picture book. It's like reading class, but uh, um, <clears throat> for all students, they may have very few chances to see a book with a lot of pictures for example. So we need to uh, introduce how our picture book class is. So, and that maybe this, the, the teacher would like to give a lot of examples. So that's the purpose of the very first so, orientation so class. Let me Sorry. ask this, what, what, what gets people to volunteer? Why are they volunteering? Um, they're not getting any monetary uh, reward for it. Uh, are they maybe, um, retired or they may be um, can't, can't have, an, have a, an illness where they can't be in a physical school. So this is an opportunity for them to teach via technology into the school. So they have a sense of purpose. Is that the reason some people get involved? I, I think I remember reading Charan's dissertation. I think one of the teachers had, a, had an illness or had had an illness in the past, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But what, 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 that's, a, that's a lot of support that, that's uh, in a voluntary nature. And I'm always interested in why people volunteer to do things online. Like in the US, we have uh, the Merlot website where people put content resources to share in an open educational resource. We're just sharing. I'm always interested in why people share, uh, why people do all voluntary educational things. So do you have a sense of that? Um, maybe Chara could uh, answer that more, but uh, in my in my own observation, I think one one thing is very important to 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 those uh, voluntary uh, teachers um, is that the word is connection. Uh, I think uh, people like to join with a group that can connect people with the same purpose, mm -hmm. or, or or that in that group they can share ideas. And also, uh, uh, when they feel the connection with other people, and the, that people includes not only students but also the teachers and other volunteer teachers as well. So that connection makes people fe feel that their life is more meaningful. That, that's my observation. I'm, I'm not sure Chaoran yes. um, has the same <laughs> agree with me, but maybe uh, some other things, Chaoran. Yeah, Chaoran, and then Young has a question for you. So Chaoran. Yeah, sure. I totally agree with uh, Jasmine. I think that's one of the things the the, uh, the program really does well is try to um, create this community um, among the teachers. And we have the, the group chat and people can share their teaching experiences, um, teaching materials, and also strategies of teaching online. So if we don't have that kind of support, uh, I think if you're just teaching alone, you won't feel uh, like you're really um, improving your teaching and also helping uh, more uh, other people to connect and uh, others to, to improve their teaching and also help students to, to learn uh, the content better. So um, I, I totally agree with you, yeah. Thank you. So thank you. Um, my, my I really have this, you know, in general speaking, uh, there are many more people wants to become tutors because they gain a lot more than the students who are tutored. You know, uh, uh, Chris, you might remember the one laptop, all those kind of things. So we had dreamed about connecting students to outsiders. Chao Zhan, you got a dissertation out of your work. So, so, the, 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 so, so I've seen a lot of these reactions. So we have outsiders from Shanghai, from Beijing, from the US to tutor those students. They benefit a lot more. A lot of the students from local poor villages, first of all, I don't know if they truly can have access to their lab, Chao Zhan, you were showing. All those devices cost a lot of money. Second of all, I don't know if it had the internet to actually do that kind of work and you know, all, all those kind of things. So I'm really curious, uh, Chao Zhan and Jasmine, from your work, you know, are we isolating the local teachers? 
you know, or should we just spend more money training local teachers, get them to become better? Or are we changing the local teachers? Are we putting them on the side? And also, you know, a lot of high school students in China, uh, they said, okay, they want to earn some credit so they can apply for American universities. So they go tutor other students, but most of them, really, people are not read really into that. So I just want to want you guys to, to comment on the value of this and also on how common are there you know, schools with such kind of elaborate uh, uh, connections? I remember Pune, I remember uh, uh, in uh, uh, Nepal, that's kind of different context. Students were taking MOOCs independently rather than have rely on people to teach them and have a local teacher to supervise them. I just think that's really elaborate. Can you just comment on this? Any comments would be valuable. Yeah. Thank you, Yong. That's a really uh, great question. <laughs> so um, I, I think uh, from my experience, um, when I was working with the, um, as you mentioned, if, if we're isolating the local teacher or um, things like that, I, I try to really uh, have more dialogue in terms uh, of teaching and to understand their practices and also how I can better um, accommodate their needs. Uh, and I, I remember when I was doing uh, an interview with a uh, local teacher, so the classroom teacher mentioned, oh, um, I think uh, by coming to your class and I can see that uh, I'm also learning about how to teach um, using this material and engage with students. And I really talk with the online teacher to share how we can better collaborate in, in terms of uh, facilitating this class so that I can incorporate this into my own class. So I, I heard that's uh, one of the comments I heard from uh, during my uh, research. Uh, so the teacher is really trying to um, learn from also from this collaboration. I would say uh, if sometimes uh, you know, we don't know uh, all about uh, the how, how people work. And uh, I think that's something maybe uh, Jasmine can um, like share with more in terms of the working with uh, the school teachers aspect. But based on my experience, that's um, something I really want to, to focus on. And, uh, and in terms of uh, the students, um, I think uh, yesterday I was having a conversation with, with Jasmine, she mentioned about the, the age of uh, the, yeah, I, I, I couldn't remember the, the whole, I would say the goals of the nonprofit. We're, yeah. we're now, yeah, yeah, maybe you can uh, talk about that. That's right. Um, yesterday we mentioned that uh, the, the, there are three goals of our uh, organization, three words, um, as we put it as A, G, E. <laughs> A is uh, for a company. So the purpose is not to teach anything, actually. So uh, the, the, the main purpose is to accompany, accompany students, accompany teachers, accompany our volunteer teachers. And the second word is grow. And for the grow, grow growth is for everyone, actually, to, to in, uh, who involved in this, the whole process. Everyone, including the teachers, the classroom teachers, and also voluntary teachers, of course, students growth. And the last word is explore. Explore um, uh, as, as, as we, as any teachers who is preparing um, lessons to classes to, to students, of course, um, as Chara mentioned, and you have to explore a lot of uh, ways, new ways to, uh, to develop new things, which is more suitable to be delivered through online classes. And explore that word is also for uh, the classroom teachers. It's a new way for them to, to observe the class. And just as uh, 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 like uh, Professor Zhao mentioned just now, um, I think the suburb school teachers and the uh, village school teachers, classroom teachers, they really learn a lot from our interaction between volunteer teachers and the students. They involved not uh, very deeply in the classroom, but 
I think one important thing for a new teacher to learn is to observe how the class goes. And that opportunity is uh, very convenient through online classes. So the uh, school teachers, when I visit the schools myself, and the headmasters, they, they are very happy to, to, to see us. And they would say, oh, I um, really think it's a good way for them to, to, for the teachers to learn from our voluntary teachers that new way. So the three word AGE, I think is very uh, interesting. And uh, uh, the word is interesting because agent, everyone is agent, every person, even the primary school students. But here um, for that AGE, it means that we are not teaching anything to anyone, but we are just experience and that word is also uh, important for our uh, teachers to, to bear in mind, um, uh, our voluntary teachers to bear in because um, uh, we think that before we prepare anything to be delivered, that before we prepare the content, what? We all always um, bear in mind that the person uh, or the purpose is more important. So the three goals is what we mention a lot to our voluntary teachers, usually uh, at the very first orientation class, that's, yeah, that's the primary purpose, I think. A couple of real quick things. A company can be really helping those young people out who maybe have a parent who have moved to a uh, urban area and are being raised by one parent or grandparents or whatever. So it's another it's another adult mentor of some kind or um, a, a role model of some kind for these young people um, in, in some with through this program. That's not, so that's one comment. Second comment on what Young had to say about Nepal, lo and behold, after six months of get, trying for human subjects, we got approval two days ago to do human subjects with uh, do a study with the kids in Nepal and their teachers and their parents. So tomorrow morning at 8.30, 9.30 and 10.30, we're interviewing kids about why they use MOOCs and are self-directed uh, tomorrow morning. And then the teachers are gonna be during the week. And next Saturday, I have to present the research. <laughs> That's all we thought we'd be farther along than this, but uh, we'll give them a draft. Anyhow, so uh, so there's we follow up on these programs. <laughs> so, uh, Chris has a question for you all. Well, I think a lot about how to scale things up. And I, I'm impressed by what you're describing, but as it is, it's not very scalable uh, for several reasons. The equipment is relatively expensive. Um, and even though there are a lot of volunteers, there aren't a lot of volunteers relative to hundreds of millions of children. I mean, it takes a whole different scale of volunteers for that. And, and the experiences in language learning are still sort of classroom centered. Now, I am not an expert on language learning, but I work at Harvard with people who are. And they talk about the importance of seeing language in the context and in the culture. And in fact, when um, Charan talked about going to the grocery store. That's an excellent example of broadening the context and the culture within which language learning is taking place. So um, I, had, I had a couple out of the box ideas and I would love to get your response to them. My first out of the box idea is about technology. Uh, when I interact with people in China, I use WeChat. It, it works a lot better, frankly, than Zoom or, or you know, higher end video conferencing programs. It's, it's very sophisticated in how it works. And I wonder what percentage of the learning could be attained with a cell phone running, running WeChat hooked to a projector to make the image bigger. And when kids want to say something, they come up to the front of the classroom instead of having a microphone at their desk. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not as elegant, but it would, it would do something. And so my first question, and I want to ask all the questions, and then I'll ask you to respond to any that you want to, would be, suppose we set up just a simple WeChat with a projector. Could we do 
of what the teacher does? Could we do 50%? Could we do 70%? I know we couldn't do 100%, but when you're trying to scale, you ask questions like, can I do 70% of the power at 30% of the cost? That's a really interesting question for scale. So then I thought, well, but, but you know, it, I, I couldn't do this, for example, because I don't speak Chinese. And, and so I thought, well, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a limit, the limit of the pool. And then I thought about smart speakers. What if you had a volunteer and a smart speaker at the, at the English speaking end those smart speakers now will do translation, two-way translation. Now, I would not want to negotiate, you know, a major treaty using a smart speaker as a translator, but for teaching the third grade level of any language, probably pretty good. So I'm wondering if you had somebody who didn't understand Chinese at the start, even though they might learn a lot of Chinese in the process, simple Chinese, but you have them with a smart speaker, how far could you get? Could you get 30%? Could you get 50%? Could you get 70%? That's again, a really interesting question in terms of scale. And then, and then in terms of the third question is in terms of language in con context and culture, classroom instruction of language tends to fail because it's decontextualized. And a lot of language is better understood when you're in the context and culture it's in. So here I am, I've got my cell phone, I've got my WeChat. What if I film, you know, two minutes of my putting an order in a restaurant, two minutes of a birthday party that I've gone to, two minutes of kids trick-or-treating at Halloween. And then I show the videos to the Chinese students and we talk about what they're seeing, not just the language, but the whole context and culture within the language is taking place. Would that add, would that subtract? I'd love to have a language expert answer that question. So I'm, I guess I'm suggesting that, that there are some interesting opportunities for scale here on paper, but I don't really know from your experience as experts as to whether any of those might work. So I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, I think I, from my experience, that's, those are really interesting um, points. I, actually, I haven't really thought about that, but really interesting. So uh, as to uh, your mentioning about the scaling, so I remember I visited one of the schools and the school has um, um, one classroom connected with another classroom. So, which basically means this online teacher is teaching, um, connecting with this face-to-face -face class. However, this whole interaction between this online teacher group and the classroom is video streamed and uh, connected with another class. So that um, at the same time, different classes are actually uh, all connecting with the online teacher. I know it's very high requirement in terms of the technology. And that's something I visited when uh, uh, the the nonprofit was trying to uh, installing the in equipment, but I didn't know how it it, it went. Uh, so I think that's one of the ways they are trying to to connect with more uh, students. Um, in terms of your other uh, comment uh, about the language learning, I uh, I agree with you. Language is more learned through um, you uh, connecting with the real the authentic. Uh, tasks and also the context. Um, but there is also the other aspect in terms of language learning. I think it's uh, very concerned, especially with uh, Chinese learners. Sometimes they, they feel they have to feel really comfortable and confident in order to speak uh, and try to learn it. So uh, sometimes, uh, yes, in classroom, it has a lot of uh, li uh, limitations, but when the teacher can uh, build more um, connection and uh, trust. Uh, the students build more trust with the teacher. They feel more comfortable in terms of speaking. And I think it's uh, very important for beginner learners 
um, and that's something I always try to, to do. Um, I'm not sure if using the, the cell phone. I know some students, they have cell phones and they, they actually, when I was visiting uh, the, my dissertation study, uh, the site, the students tried to find the English learning uh, short videos uh, in, the, um, in the, the, the video app um, so, uh, and uh, online. So uh, they try to find materials like you mentioned, uh, how people speak in, in terms of in specific scenarios. Uh, but those things, we, I think if we can uh, provide more materials um, for students to, to watch or maybe to interact with, that can, can be more helpful. Yeah. And just me, maybe you, you, if you want to add anything. Um, one thing from, from my personal point of view is that because I'm not an expert in any subjects, I mean, uh, in any discipline, and I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the, the very first orientation class, uh, one finding is that, very interesting, is that I think for limited time and space in village school, especially in online class, um, it, there is not very clear uh, difference between any any subjects and one trend here now for one of our science teacher who is trying to do is that she's combining a lot of subjects in one class so when she teaches science she use a lot of um, maybe uh, music materials as well and she uh, does uh, experiments through the video and also she um, involves in um, let students to do painting in class as well. And sometimes she even asks students to write a poem in, in her science class. So it's, it's a very amazing experience and amazing um, try, try for her. And she is encouraged to, to do that in our organization as well. I think it's um, a very good trend for all our teachers, for our, all our voluntary teachers to try not to focus on one subject in one class, but to try to use every means that he could think of. And so maybe that, um, for example, uh, so English class in, in our classroom is not just English. People can sing, can dance, can even draw pictures. And one uh, learning for students, uh, apart from uh, English in that class is that they they, they, they feel happy in, the, in that class. And when they feel happy, they can open their heart and they, uh, they feel at ease so that maybe in the next class, face-to-face class, face -face class with a, a local teacher, he is, when he is open, that situation is, is, is very good, I, we think, psych psychologically. The students is happy, bring the happiness to the next class. So, one feedback from our students from the, the those village uh, village schools is that students after they have uh, 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 stayed with us for uh, at least one year we found that the students they are very happy and they are open to more possibilities to more ways of learning and we think that's a very good uh, side effect of our, of our teaching. So uh, that's what I, I want to uh, comment. So uh, Chris, um, thanks for that comment about language expert. I cannot claim to be a language expert, but half of my PhD was in bilingual education. I also, uh, I went to a school, a very rural school, uh, learning English when I was 14. I also taught high school in rural areas. And about Punia, maybe 15 years ago, I was running the first online Chinese program in the US. I've designed video games to teach English and Chinese. I've done a lot of research in this area. So, so Chris, I, I just want to respond to some of these things and which may be interesting. Uh, Jasmine and Charles, and let's think about this. First of all, by and large, second language education is pathologically uh, uh, a failure. It's actually success is a pathology in, in second language acquisition. Do, can you imagine each year 
how many second language learners learn a second language without achieving any status? I mean, in the US, you, you, know, you take high school Spanish for three years, you can barely order a drink when you go to Mexico. You might so just imagine how, patholo how pathological that is, right? And of course, we, we, we start teaching in high school, which is a mistake. But the, the actually interesting thing is that um, Chinese language school, I'm actually running some experiments in Chongqing with uh, kids, but not learning language, but doing something else. But a big problem with the language learning is too much teaching. We just teach too much, you know? So when you are bringing more volunteers, what are, everybody loves to teach. You know, very few people like learning. We all love to teach. You know, when we get something, we want to teach somebody something. So, so I was thinking about, if you created truly a way to authentically communicate, like Chris was saying, you know, short videos of Halloween, whatever, you know, that might engage children into more practice, more uses. Second thing is the lack of purpose. You know, in China and in many countries, learning is really no purpose. What the purpose is to take the college entrance exam. So, so you know, when you are teaching, I'm sure child and they you have to say, okay, what about the subjects? What about the local exam? What about this? The teachers cannot let go of that, you know. And third of all is that uh, how do you form a community? You know, it, it's you. I'm sure you you got your own work. You know, and, and uh, you you got your own life. You can't be with the students all the time. So how do you formulate those communities and how do you drive those kind of things? So I was wondering if uh, the, the volunteer organization would promote a different pedagogy. A pedagogy is massively distributed. It is allow students to interact, to access, because honestly, you know, I, I had a student, again, Punya know the student, she did a study of this. If everybody today could construct their own learning environment using phones, using connections, they can learn without being taught. You know, learning without being taught. Again, so I wanna say, you know, so can we just formulate a new way of teaching, a new way of learning without someone to teach that? That would be very, very meaningful uh, research around this. So just my comments. Okay, so thank you. So um, if I can just quickly follow up on that, I think the point, Zhao, that you make about language, you know, how it fails when it's done in schools. I mean, I have two of my kids who did, I don't know how many years of Spanish and seriously, there's, they remember nothing of it. But on the other hand, by the time I was 10 years old, I had learned English, Hindi, Oriya, Assamese, and Mizo five languages and had lost Mizo completely. Like I knew it when I was nine, I had completely lost it by the time I was, because my parents moved part, you know, in, in, in South, uh, sorry, not South, the Eastern side of India, which is a tribal state. And my parents never had language. It was just impossible for them to learn. And I soaked it up and I was fluent. I could, I used to translate for them. And so, it's it's that immersion in that in that language, you know. And my wife and I we speak different languages because in India, when I go to her state, I'll be there fifteen days. I start dreaming in the language. I still can't speak it, but in my head, because I'm hearing it all the time, I start dreaming it. And I know if I stay there for six months, I will start speaking it. So I think that for language learning, this idea of immersion of which is not a community it is a, you're just leading your life and over time person you'll just get it i think that's a really important point um but anyway there's a question from lydia gao who's one of our regular uh you know listeners viewers uh so she first thanks you for your mission and she was wondering if you find limitations or advantages in terms of pedagogy when teaching in this hybrid space. And I want to have a follow up to that, which is what are your plans for the future? Because I mean, and Zhao have been offering all these ideas. Uh, what are your plans about expansion, growth, change? What do you see as coming down? So first limitation and advantages and sort of what are your next steps could be? Uh, 
um, maybe Jasmine can <laughs> comment about the future because I, <laughs> I, uh, well, I don't know. Well, then you, you've got the pedagogy down. So just tell All me right, you'll, the you'll get the pedagogy <laughs> take, and Jasmine take, deals take with it. Yeah, you take Lydia's okay. question and, and Jasmine take yeah, Punya's question, okay? Sure, thank you. Um, so in terms of pedagogy, I, I have to admit that what we can do is really limited because we only have uh, each like week, we have only one class um, in terms, especially in terms of language learning, you all talk about the immersion, which is important. Um, it's really hard to, to offer everything if you just want to um, get it down in 40 minutes. But what um, I really uh, echo with you is that uh, we provide the resources or the ways um, that students uh, can learn how to engage with different learning materials so that they can develop the kind of um, learning habits or the disposition towards language learning, which will be really helpful if they uh, love to learn the language and they know what resources um, are available if, if the organization or other uh, maybe programs can provide uh, with them more resources and so that they, they know how to access them and how to learn. And um, I would say from my experience in terms of uh, observing, um, so students, uh, not all of them have cell phones, but some of them um, have cell phones and they, they really, they know how to uh, try to uh, by do or search for information. So um, I figure out that students also form some uh, self-study groups, which is very fascinating for me when I was uh, staying at, uh, one of the uh, schools in, uh, in Southwestern China for my dissertation group, because the online English teacher, I wasn't the teacher, but I was a researcher. So the online teacher cannot um, meet with them every day, but she really, she was in the uh, student created QQ chat group. And she uh, often frequently posted some audio recordings or other visuals. Uh, and try to uh, send more resources to that group. And students, uh, when they have some questions about the homework, and they also created this uh, self-formed uh, learning group. That is something I find uh, really cool. And uh, I think if the nonprofit organization can use more of those uh, different platforms and to help facilitate the students learning outside the class, that would be, uh, really uh, a good way to yeah to to engage uh, students I agree uh, Jasmine go for um Punya's question and I was going to ask the same thing so I'm glad Punya asked that um so um I, I just have a very um a personal idea from um, to add uh regarding this question because I think for young learners uh for, for, for young learners, um, no matter what way they learn, one important thing is to change often. I mean, the ways. For example, they cannot have math class a whole day. <laughs> and so, so, so uh, that means um, when they see a new teacher through the online class, they feel fresh and they, that stimulate their desire to learn new things. And I believe, um, thanks to the technology today, and of course, the technology will 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 change in the future. And everyone knows that uh, because of the pand pandemic, and a lot of things are moving online, and uh, and that is a challenge. And also, uh, I think is a is, is a good way for a lot of people to try to to accept the, those change, and especially for young learners, they are quicker. Than, than adults, I think, to, to be adapted to new changes. And no matter what kind of change, but change and new things can is, is always good for, for young learners. That, that's my point of view. Yeah. So I'm gonna just make a quick, com two comments. Um, Chris asked about scale and you responded, I think with a transfer issue and a readiness issue uh, or example that you know, the students can transfer from one mode to another, from one discipline to another, that you might, might developmentally prepare them for alternative kinds of instruction after your volunteer teachers are gone, they're ready for it. 
but you really didn't answer the scalability question of, 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 the, of your initiative, of your nonprofit. And it's something you're gonna have to wrestle with, I think, uh, throughout this coming decade as you try to expand and, and, and venture into other pursuits potentially. Uh, maybe we, you can think about that, maybe it can be your final comment on, on what's the future and, and, and what your vision is. Um, the other comment I have is Sapunya learned many questions, many languages and forgot one rather quickly. And, and your microphone died when you said, how many years later did you lose that? Punya, how, many, wh how long was it before you lost the language? One year, okay, so uh, we lost Sorry, uh, one year, yes. So we, <clears throat> till 19, by 1975, I knew Mizo, 1976, I didn't. Yeah. Well, uh, in, in, in 1981 or 82, I knew Visicalc and Lotus 123 very well. <laughs> I was a wizard in those uh, as an accountant and whatnot. And today my life, if I had to do an Excel spreadsheet, I, you know, I'd be fired because I don't know a thing about it. You know, so it's, it's not just language skills. That you lose a lot of other skills and competencies rather quickly if you don't use them. Um, but, uh, but Young wants to jump in here for a question. We have a few minutes. We have about five minutes left or four minutes left. Young. I really don't have a question. I just want to thank you guys for, for doing this. This is, uh, you know, these are experiments we are running globally speaking. And, uh, you know, the students in rural and poor areas, uh, another, another point I think Chao Zhang made very well, you're trying to help them to learn independently. So I, I think in how do you help these students to become independent learners? Uh, These are not only happening in rural areas, but in any disadvantaged communities, even in the U.S. So uh, uh, Pune and I, you know, we've been talking a lot about how, how do you liberate children to become confident, independent learners, you know, without being depressed, without being taught about, you know, learned helplessness. So I, I want to congratulate you, uh, Jasmine Chao Zhan, for doing this work. But I think the key is to, for everybody, especially poor kids, kids in rural areas, to develop the sense of independence, the confidence that they can gain, they can get something out of it. You know, so that, that's really important. And another thing I was really wondering, I hope maybe Jasmine you can address a little bit. How do you know if your volunteer is good? That's really a good question. Not every volunteer teacher is good, actually. Um, we, uh, uh, our, me, myself, and our other voluntary uh, teacher trainers, uh, they would observe their classes. That is the first thing that we do. And also, uh, we get feedback from the students as well as the teachers. I know Chao Ran and also helped in with one of our survey one, one, once, right? So, um, and uh, another thing is that um, we think we, uh, we, we, our volunteer teachers, not every one of them could teach for uh, consistent, consistently. Most of them maybe uh, will teach one semester, two semesters, three semesters. So, and also uh, that's one limitation, I think, uh, for voluntary teachers because it, we, it's fluid. It, it, it's not a fixed organization, fixed ways. So we, we are trying, we're thinking ways to improve that as, as well. Taran, you have a final comment? Cause we only have a half minute left here. So I'll give you a, a last word on this. Uh, no, I, I just want to thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I, I really um, learned a lot actually from this conversation yeah, because some of the things I have never thought about. So uh, I appreciate everyone who's watching. Charan, was it serendipitous that you got into this or was it purposeful? Did you just chance upon it and once upon a time? Did someone mm -hmm. email you about it? How do people find out basically about this program? Oh, uh, it's one of, uh, so actually I, my classmates, not my classmate, my, uh, well, I was, uh, yeah, from my undergrad program, he was involved. And then I saw he posted in the WeChat and I thought, wow, this learning is so cool. Yeah, and I just want to participate. So that's how I started five years ago. 
That's what Chris said. It's WeChat. I have WeChat. I'm sure Young has WeChat. I'm sure you have. I'm sure Jasmine does. Punya, you have WeChat? You'd be no, there. I don't. You've got to get WeChat. You're the only one left out there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to thank Jasmine and Charan for coming in on the show. It was fabulous. This really evolved as we're going through this into a lot of important issues that, that not, you're not the only ones facing, that many organizations like yours are. Uh, but Chris has to introduce show, uh, episode 82 now. So again, thank you very much for coming in. Yes, next week, uh, Saturday, November 6th, we will return to our usual 5.30 p.m. time. Some of you may know about a term called the metaverse, which emerged in science fiction first from uh, people like William Gibson. And um, in immersive learning, the metaverse has long been a kind of... Uh, goal of where we might go to have hybrid virtual environments and real world environments. Well, um, Facebook is a company that has put a lot of effort into this. In fact, they now are going to call themselves Meta. And we have two experts from Facebook very much involved in this, who next Saturday are going to share the kinds of things that are emerging and why this might be important for education. So. I hope you'll tune in and join us.